We're all doing okay. I know it's been a really rough weekend for many of you. I'm again uh, doing the lecture from home and I know that many of you may not be able to make the lecture um, to, um, in uh, live and so it's absolutely fine. You can watch the recording. Uh, I had to do the recording regardless so I'm doing the recording and doing live stream and Leo is here on Teams again to take your questions so please remember he's there and feel free to ask questions if you have them uh, about anything that's coming up uh, including just uh, how we're dealing with the COVID situation, but also obviously assignments and, and questions about the, the lecture themselves. All right, um, I, as light relief here, I'm gonna show you my dog for a minute because I thought maybe you'd like to see that. She doesn't, she doesn't normally come to class, but seeing as we're doing it remotely, she, here she is. There she is. So she, um, she's a border collie and she runs, t runs with me all the time. Very good girl. <laughs> all right, with that, I'll, uh, I'll continue with our actual scheduled program and get on with the lecture. Uh, so um, let's start with um, uh, some admin. First of all, assignment one. Uh, those of you who are paying attention to Piazza will notice that, that I made the decision to extend the deadline. As I said in my Piazza post, this is the first time in 10 years that I've extended an assignment deadline. The reason for this uh, I outlined in the Piazza post, but basically the situation here got very complicated. We had a small technical hitch, which would have been fixed, normally be fixed very fast. It wasn't fixed, that surprised me. It turned out that IT staff had a, had a fairly significant um, issue going on, which related to the outbreak. So um, they didn't respond until this morning. That and a whole bunch of other things made me think that at this point, the best thing to do was to um, uh, extend it by 24 hours. So please notice it's extended. Please also make sure that um, you follow the pre-submission checklist because I think not everyone is doing that. Um, let me remind you where that is. It's on the, um, in the Piazza post and it's also on the course webpage. So there's a checklist here. It says make sure you've double checked the integrity statements. You've, you've checked uh, the deal about deadlines. We don't extend them. Here I've extended for the whole class but we don't extend it for individuals. Um, and 24 hours before the deadline, which is kind of now, make sure you do an upstream pool and um, make sure that you're, um, you've got a truthful and complete statement of um, originality. It's really important. Don't make a mistake now, folks. This assignment is redeemable. Please don't submit work here that isn't your own. If you do, this, the consequences can be really dire, okay? The best thing to do at this stage, if you're in that situation, is to get rid of anything that is not yours or just don't submit the assignment at all. Um, and then uh, you just get the marks redeemed, okay? So just um, please take, my, take notice of that. Um, in terms of upstream pool, I think one thing I've seen people do, um, I've seen some discussion on Piazza where people seem confused about the upstream pool. You've got to do the upstream pool, uh, but the CI won't see the effect of that until next time you do a push. And so you're gonna to have to like change something, commit it and push it, and then the CI will uh, say, oh, okay, you've got the right stuff, okay? So you do the upstream pull and then you um, do some more work and a push. If you don't have any more work to do, then just make a, a trivial change, to, like put, put a little space somewhere and then commit that and push it. All right. If you have any questions about assignment one or anything to do with it at the high level, I can't answer your specific questions about the tasks right now in the lecture, but if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat and Leo uh, is right here um, with me on Teams and he'll voice them to me and I'll, and I'll hear him ask the question. So please do that if you have any questions. This week we have a lab exam. This should not be daunting. Most of you are gonna get a great mark in this, I hope. You, certainly the vast majority of you will pass. Um, the, why do I know that so confidently? Because the content of the lab exam has already been given to you, okay? It's all based off homework questions which you've already got. So you had lots of time to prepare for it since the start of semester, and um, we'll just be asking you questions you've already seen. You're gonna get a random selection of those questions, and we're gonna give you plenty of time. Most students, I think, finish between 20 minutes and 40 minutes. Some students, for a variety of reasons, will take longer, and we're giving you up to 90 minutes, okay? 90 minutes should cover everyone in the class. Okay, some of you will, fi will finish it quite quickly. All right, so you should not feel time pressured. You should not feel under stress about this. And it's also redeemable, remember that. Okay, so please don't feel stressed about this. We're gonna use self-invigilation. I need to remind you what this is. I, I mentioned in the last lecture, I'll mention it again now. Um, it's described here under the assessments final exam page. And here it is, self-invigilation. The principle here is uh, simple. We want you, we don't want to put spyware on your computer, we're not doing that but we do want you to have the opportunity to say, hey, look, I did everything right. So if you invigilate yourself, 
You can follow the instructions there very carefully. You can make a recording of what you've done. If someone was, was to ask questions about what you did, you would have the option, if you wanted, to present that information to us to say, well, look, I, uh, I um, did the right thing here and uh, here's a recording of it, okay? So that's the basic idea. Um, it's entirely optional. You, you can ask questions about it. Um, if by doing it in a lab exam, part of what's gonna happen with a lab exam is the actual mechanics with the git and the self modulation are gonna be just like the mid-semester and just like the end of your exam. But this is low stakes, okay? So the lab exam should be low stress, low stakes. Um, so uh, doing all these things now is good because you should get all these, if there's any, anything not working or your, your, uh, your computer's misbehaving or whatever, you'll find it out now instead of in a more important setting such as the mid-semester exam or the final exam at the end of the year. So um, don't be overly stressed. The, the, the lab exam is redeemable and it should not be too difficult. Uh, one more point in case it wasn't 100% obvious to you. You do your lab exam in your scheduled lab. You can't go to another lab, okay? You have to go to your scheduled lab. Okay, if you have an emergency and you can't make your lab, you'll just have to miss the lab exam and you get it redeemed, okay? Um, if something else happens and you have any questions, just contact me privately. But you have to do it in your lab. Only your tutor can mark it. Your tutor will be there and we only, only run the lab exams during your scheduled lab. Uh, finally, assignment two. Assignment two, I was gonna release it right before, I was gonna release it when I, when, when the other assignment closed, the other assignment hasn't closed, because I gave you a 24-hour extension. So we're planning to do that later tonight. Now something interesting about assignment two, unlike previous years and previous semesters, we're releasing in two stages, very deliberately, okay? First of all, we're explaining the problem to you, the problem you're gonna solve. And then um, at the end of week five, we'll give you all the crunchy details. We're doing this very deliberately because we want you to think about the problem without um, being overwhelmed by the details of how we're gonna test it and so forth, okay? And your first exercise for assignment two is a design exercise, and we deliberately want you to do that design exercise without being overly focused on details of implementation associated with unit tests we give you and things like that, okay? So the unit tests and um, all the details of encoding will be released uh, at the end of week five. And, but tonight or tomorrow morning, you'll get the uh, original version of the assignment, which explains everything, explains uh, what you've got to do at the, at the high level. And uh, your first exercise will be to meet your group mates and to do a design exercise. Um, in the lecture today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about software engineering, two elements about software engineering today. One's about Git, and then you're going to do a lab exercise soon, which shows you how to do Git in a team setting, which is just the next level on from doing Git in isolation. And, um, and I'm also gonna to talk to you about team dynamics, okay? That, and that's something that's actually accessible in this course. There will be, uh, there, there could be exam question on this thing. And of course, it's the, the reason why it's in here is not because I wanna make an assessment of it, but because it should be a useful tool for you as you work on your assignment. Um, please remember to check the deadlines on the course website. They've been all updated. Some of you previously noticed the assignment two deadlines were not all up to date. Some of them referred to semester one and so forth and so on. That should all be completely consistent now. If you go to the course website, you'll see them. They're, they're fully revised. Uh, some of the marks have moved, moved around ever so slightly. The uh, design task, which you do first, is, is, is uh, less marks now than it was before and so forth. So please make sure you go there and check it. Let's have a look. I got it here, deliverables. Yeah, you can see here um, the deliverables for this assignment. There's a whole list here. Um, and you'll see that uh, there's the main, main deliverable is uh, due at the uh, week 11. And you've got uh, an analysis and design one, which is during, due during your lab in a week five. It's only worth one mark. It's really important you do this, but if you get it all wrong, it's not a big deal. It's worth one mark out of 15, out of, out of 30, one mark out of 30, okay? So um, you've got an analysis and design exercise you're gonna do as a team, and that's due in week five. Alrighty, um, I think we're ready to move on. Um, if you, please, if you have any questions, make sure you raise them with Leo um, and he can voice them. I haven't heard any yet, but I'm always happy to answer questions as, uh, as you bring them along. Okay, the next, um, unless there's any questions, the next thing we're gonna do is uh, the, our second module on JavaFX. You may remember that JavaFX is the uh, tool provided by uh, Oracle to allow us to do uh, platform independent uh, graphics and windows and all that sort of thing, okay? 
And if you watched or you, you were live at the last lecture, you would have seen us do tremendously exciting things like create a red square, create text in a particular font, and make uh, windows and text uh, translucent or uh, transparent. Okay, that's what we did in the last um, thing. Now we're going to do something which is a little bit more interesting because it blends some issues associated with JavaFX with some really interesting programming language issue, uh, in particular the concept of event handling, which is a really good idea for you to get yourself on top of because it's a, it's a very important and deep concept which goes well beyond JavaFX. It's a general idea. Okay, so that's what we're going to do now. So what is event handling? Event handling is another control flow construct. Okay, so you, if you remember our, our imperative um, uh, programming, you remember we've got um, sequence, selection, and iteration. So uh, selection is branches, we've got loops, which is uh, iteration, and we've also got constructs like methods, which allow us to encapsulate a bunch of ideas in a little piece of code, uh, uh, in a, um, a named piece of code. Okay, that's what a method is, you're familiar with that now. So what we're adding to this is this concept of an event. Now events are really interesting and slightly surprising. And um, later on in the semester, we're gonna do another con weird control flow thing, which is called exceptions. We've bumped into them occasionally as we've gone along in the, the first four weeks, um, but we haven't covered them directly. We will be covering them properly um, later in semester, but there's a connection between events and um, and and exceptions. The connection is that they both have really strange, mysterious control flow. So I'm sure most of you now really understand the idea of um, uh, iteration, right? I'm um, sorry, sequence of sequence. When the next line of code, the, the one when you execute a line of code, the one below it will be executed unless something else happens, right? That's that's um, sequence. Selection is an if statement or a, or a switch statement, and then iteration. You've got for loops, while loops, do loops. Okay, then you've got methods. Now events um, allow us to spontaneously jump to another place in our program when something outside of our program happens, such as someone clicking a mouse, someone press, pressing a space bar, and so forth. Right? If you think about it, you wonder how would you write a program that did something every time a particular button on the keyboard was pressed. The thing that's tricky is how would you do that with loops and um, branches and um, you know, sequence selection and um, iteration, how would you do that? Um, and, and the answer is you can't really gracefully do it unless you keep checking the same thing again and again and again. So what an event does is something under the hood, which we're not gonna get into now, something under the hood keeps doing that checking to see if a key's been pressed or a, key's been, or, or a mouse has been clicked. It keeps doing that. And when something like that happens, it does what we told it to, okay? And so the way we do that, is we provide it with a piece of code. We say, do this stuff when that event happens. So if someone presses the spacebar, do this thing. If um, someone clicks the mouse, do that thing, okay? And that is called event handling. The event is the press of the spacebar, the click of the mouse, or the, the, the roll of the scroll thing on the mouse, or whatever it is, that's an event, okay? And event handling is us saying, when this time, type of event happens, please do this thing. And we're going to write, we're going to work through a, uh, an example shortly, which will make this much more crisp and clear. Um, so, what I just said relies on the idea that we write a piece of code, which we're going to we're going to um, uh, give to the event uh, handling system and say, do this thing whenever that particular event happens, all right? So the question is, how do I pass code as an argument in Java? And you guys should try and um, write something in the chat on Teams to tell me how you think we can pass code as an argument in Java, okay? How do we pass code as an argument in Java? Remember, that's what we've got to do here. We've got to say to the event handling system, hey, when someone presses the shift key or when someone presses the space bar key, please do this thing. So this thing, what does this thing mean? Well, this thing is gonna to amount to essentially to a method or a piece of code. How do we pass that as an argument to this thing? Anyone have an answer? I don't hear anything from Leo. Well, the answer is actually something we just did, and that is lambda expressions, okay? So what happens is the event handling system takes a lambda. Oh, Leo's got a question for me, I think. Uh, no, I'm just saying a lot of students say that it's lambda or function. 
Excellent. Leo has told me that a lot of you said it was a lambda. Good on you. That's exactly the right answer. It is. A lambda expression allows us to do that. Before we had lambda, and we had event handling in Java before lambdas, okay, before Java 8, we used to have to pass an object with no, with no fields. So object with no data, that means it's just got behavior, not uh, data. And, um, and we just pass that. But now we have lambdas, we can pass a lambda. All right, so well done, you who thought it was a lambda. That's exactly what I want to hear. All right, so now we can talk more concretely about how events work in JavaFX. Just a reminder, in case you missed what I said at the start of this little module, events are a concept that are not specific to JavaFX. They're a general concept in programming languages. That's why it's so important that you understand it because you can go program in another language and you, you may still run into the question of events, particularly if you do anything related to, uh, to, to graphical user interfaces, okay? So I really want you to understand the concept of an event. And then specifically on this slide here, we're now talking about how JavaFX deals with events. Now every event is of a specific type, which is a subclass of JavaFX.Event.Event. And every event has a thing which describes what type of event it is, and it could be a key press, a key being typed, which is a press and release, a mouse being clicked, etc., etc. That's a, that's the type. The source and the target, okay? And the source and the target are things that we may want to care about. If you've got a complex scene, you can find out where the mouse was when it got clicked, okay? So it's, if it's over something, and you can have different things handle the event according to where the mouse was at that time. That's obviously very useful information. All right, so event handlers, we pass a lambda expression. And um, for example, we have uh, a thing which says set on key typed, and then we can write the code. And you can see there, oh, my cat is now interrupting my lecture, just one minute. Before I, before I let her out of the door, I might as well show it to you. There she is, there's the cat. All right, someone, can, uh, someone else in my household will let her out of the room. She uh, woke up, I must have been. Uh, bothering her with my talk of lambdas. Um, all right, anyway, so this is what it looks like. Set on key typed event and then, then your code. Remember the lambda syntax. The arrow says, uh, separates the arguments. In this case, there's one argument called event and then your code, which will receive that, which, which can use that argument event to do stuff, okay? So the things between the curly braces is your code, which is gonna say what to do. And the thing on the, on the left-hand side of the arrow is event. That's the name of the parameter which goes to our method, which is called event, and it's going to be of type uh, JavaFX event dot event. Okay, so what's going to happen is in our code we can look at what kind of event it was and do different things accordingly. So time for our first mini quiz. Hopefully uh, this will work just fine. Publish the poll. There we go. Hopefully that you all saw that. And with that we can move on and write some code. Um, there we are, and this, this is the, just as a reminder, this is the code that we did at the end of last lecture. Let's just quickly rerun this um, in case anyone missed it. Um, this was our hello world in JavaFX. And we created a small window and we made the text transparent, semi-transparent. And here in this case, I made the window transparent. You can see it's, you can see through it, right? So it's a transparent window. All right, so that's what we did in the last lecture. What we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, create um, what, I'm going to do is I'm going to steal code from the last lecture, but what I might do to make things clearer to you and just to remind everyone, I'm going to uh, initially write it from scratch and then I'll just cut and paste in code from the other lecture, uh, the, the more boring bits. But I'll write the key, uh, we'll do the, the key things first. Okay, so file, first of all, we'll create a new class. It's going to be called, what are we going to call it? Uh, J JFX key event, right? So new Java class, we'll call it JFX, JFX key event like that. Okay, there, there it is. Now, um, what we want to do, we want to add it to Git, yep. What we want to do now is we want to make this a JavaFX um, class. What do we need to do to make a JavaFX class? Can anyone, anyone remember? Right? If we want to make this a JavaFX class, we need to extend JavaFX.application.application. That's how we make it a JavaFX class. This is very important. Okay, so we have to say here, say extends, then application and then we have to make sure we choose the right one notice there's quite a few different ones there or actually there's just two there but we have to choose the right one so we choose this there it is okay and we get a red squiggly line why do we get the red squiggly line it's because there's stuff we need to do and uh, IntelliJ is going to be very helpful here and it says uh, it'll implement the stuff that's missing 
okay? And every time you do this, you have to implement the start method and it gives you the stage. Remember what the stage is? The stage in JavaFX is like the uh, operating system window. So the thing with the, like here with the, the, with the buttons on the top left here and the title at the top and so forth, that's the stage. And we're gonna put stuff inside of the stage. Now at this point, to save time, I'm just gonna cut and paste a bunch of stuff from that, here it is, hello world. I'm gonna cut and paste this stuff like this, I'll, I'll edit it shortly, but we'll just cut and paste this in to, to um, save time so you don't have to see a whole bunch of tedious typing. There we go. And um, what we're gonna do, we're just gonna make a few changes here. We're gonna change the, we're gonna change it um, here to JFX key press, right? And the title, in case you've forgotten, is the thing that appears actually on the window decoration for your operating system. Right, so whenever you've got a window in whatever operating system you have, you'll have something usually in the, the top of the window frame that says what the name of the window is. That's the title. Okay, so key press. Um, in fact, we're not going to do key press. I think we're going to do key typed. Okay, key type. Now I'm going to explain in a minute what the difference is between a key type. In fact, if anyone's got ideas on what the difference is between typing and pressing a key, please uh, put it in the chat and I will... Um, um, ask Leo to tell me when I get up to that part. Okay, if, if anyone knows what the difference, and this is not a JavaFX thing, this is a general question. What's the difference between pressing a key and typing a key? Sounds really subtle, and it is a little bit subtle, but it's, it's actually kind of important. So we're gonna change this from being black, which is a really thick font, to a normal one. So uh, what is it, regular or normal? I forget now, normal. Okay, normal, there you go. So we're gonna make a normal font weight, and we'll leave it saying hello world for now. Okay, so let's just run this. Um, and now we need to run this particular one, which is ah, JFX key event, which is um, um, the name of the, I, I didn't change the name of the class. I probably should, should change the name of the class to JFX. Oh, key event is actually the name of the uh, thing. So hang on, hang on a sec. Key event is the, the event type. Um, now we're running it here, it's building it. Could not find JFX key event. Uh, oh, what have I done here? I've goofed. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Um, we just get a few interesting responses from students. Um, so oh, great. Um, I hit say typing is a press and a release action. Uh, and I think uh, there are a lot of similar ideas. Yeah, great. That's exactly right. And it's a, it sounds really subtle, but if you're doing something like uh, playing a game, I don't know if you guys can hear Leo's voice coming over, but he was just saying that um, someone wrote in the, in the chat that... Um, uh, the, the difference between typing and, and, and a press is that a, a typing is a press and release, okay? And this kind of matters because most often in many programs, we just care about typing. Did they type the letter A? Did they type the letter B? And so forth, right? But sometimes like if you're doing a game, you want to know if their finger is still holding down that shift key or their finger is holding the right arrow key or the left, left arrow key. So in that case, what you're concerned about is, is it still pressed, okay? So you want to know if it's when they start pressing, when they stop pressing, okay? So that's, that's the sort of thing you may want to do in some situations. For simple stuff like um, just when someone's typing things in, all we really care, care about is the typing. But there are other situations where the difference between when they press it and when they release it becomes important. And the obvious example, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is games. Now, before I go on, let me just remind you of this here. I've gone up here. Let me just do it again. I'm gonna do this from scratch just to show everyone, because I know someone asked me this on Piazza. Um, how do you make a, a new JavaFX thing? Well, you shouldn't have to do this because we've tried to set everything up so you don't have to do this. But just in case you do, um, you can go here and edit the configurations. And then I've got one here called key event, which I set up before the lecture. I made a typo in it, which is why everything complained. And I just fixed the typo while I was answering that other question. And you can see here, and what I had to do to make, you'll notice this special line here. This is the, this is the crucial one. That only comes up if you go to modify options and say add VM options. Without that, it won't have this stuff in here. And this is the junk that you need to put in to make JavaFX work. And this has been true ever since uh, Oracle and their infinite wisdom decided to not make JavaFX any longer part of the standard Java. So it's all a bit cl clunky. Um, anyway, that's an aside. If you have issues with that, you can ask on Piazza, but that, that's, that's where, you, where it works. Let's try and let me go back to where I was before. Hit the run key. And with a bit of luck, uh, there it is. Okay, so it's transparent. We don't need it transparent for this. Notice it's now thinner font and it says JFX key type. That's what it says up there. Um, I might just change this to be a bit clearer. It's a key event. That's what it is. It's a key event that is what we're dealing with. That's the name of the type. I'm gonna get rid of this stuff. We don't need to set the op opacity and make it transparent. And we can make this color whatever we want. What do we wanna make it, green? Green, yeah, let's try, oops, what happened there? 
I'll talk green again. Um, you've got a lot of different colors to choose from here. Okay, so there we go. We'll make it green and we'll run it one more time. And now it should not be transparent and it should be green and it should say key event at the top. Let's just see if it does that. There it is. Okay, so now it's green and uh, it's a nice thin font and it says key event at the top there, which is the title. All right, all good. Now what we're gonna do is the interesting part and um, we're going to add an event. Now remember here, this thing add hide, that is a very important step that I explained in the last lecture. I'm not gonna go over it now, but that is adding a text to, this, to, to the um, group the, that sits in the scene, okay? This, this stack pane that sits inside the scene. If I didn't do that add, then we wouldn't have the words appear on the screen, which is what I showed you in the last lecture. But what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna say scene, um, scene dot um, on, oops, on, key, right. Now I let the autocomplete do its thing. And um, what I want to do is on key typed um, set, oh sorry, I've made a mistake here. I want to say set, I'm setting the behavior. So that what I want is a set, set on key typed. Okay, so you can see here I've got pressed, released and typed. And so the person, someone already answered that, that issue on the chat. You can see these differences. Here we're just gonna do typed, okay? Set on key typed. And so what we're doing by calling set is just saying, hey, I wanna set the behavior that occurs when a key is typed, okay? So set the behavior for when a key is typed. That's what, what's happening. And we're gonna get, uh, the argument will be, there you go, IntelliJ is already doing the autocomplete for me. It's suggesting a variable name, it's suggesting we call it key event, and it's suggesting I do a lambda. So uh, I just started typing key and uh, IntelliJ already gave me that, that um, Autocomplete. So now we've got to write our lambda in here. Remember, that's the argument which is going to tell us what got typed. And this here is going to be what we're going to do. So one thing we can do here, which will just demonstrate the idea pretty, um, and by the way, I just added a blank line, I just put the carriage return, which um, now puts a blank line in here, which will make our code look easy to follow. But um, but notice it's, it's still just part of this little lambda here. All right, so I could have had it in one line, I could have had it in multiple lines. It's easier to read if it's multiple lines. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to, f um, um, change the text when a key gets pressed. So let's just do that first, say hi dot um, um, set uh, text, um, and then we'll say um, something got pressed or something like that. Some key got typed, right? Um, like that, okay? We'll just do that, we're gonna set that and um, Let's see what happens, all right? Let's just run that. So what that should do is we've gone to the high thing, which is the text we've got here, which is currently hello world, and we're changing the text by using the set text method to say, do this. Say, you type, type the key, now let's just run it. And it should say hello world, which is what we told it to do. And then when I press a key, it should change. Let's just see if that works. There it is, now let me press a key and nothing happened, oh yes it did. I, ju I just pressed the space bar and we got that. Okay, terrific, so it says you typed a key, which is just what we wanted. Now, let's make it a little bit more interesting and get rid of the word key and say you typed a, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say um, which key they typed, and how do we know which key they typed? Well, it's captured in the key event. So we can do this, we can do key event dot get character, that's the character they typed, and just say that. In fact, we can make it slightly fancier by putting a little inverted quote there and a string concatenation here, and a little inverted quote there. And now it should have whatever key they typed um, with little quotes around it. So let's just run that. I'm just waiting for it. My little computer's struggling here. Now I'm gonna press the Y key, see what happens. There you go, you typed a Y. Now just mash the keyboard and you get all this stuff happening, all right? So, um, you typed a quote <laughs> or whatever. Okay, so you, whatever key you typed is now coming up there. So you can, let's just recap what's going on here. This is our JFX program. We've told it, when you run, and remember nothing happens until we show the stage, okay? So this is all the stuff we've, yeah, question from. There's a very interesting question from um, um, Harrison. He asked, what's the type of a key event He's quite confused with that. Okay, what is the type of the key event? Um, that's a great question. The key event is of type, um, 
is of type key event actually. Um, so let's just see this, hang on, let's just go, that's a good question, great question. That was a great question from online. Let's do this. Now, what, when I did the dot, it's, it gave me all the different things that this, uh, that this would, um, that this variable, all the methods that on, are on this, on this, this variable. So, um, but another way to answer the question, there are multiple ways to answer that question. One is to say, okay, what can we do with a key event which implicitly answers the question, right? And you can see there, there's all the things that we can do with a key event, okay? And uh, you know you can do things like is some, has, has someone held the control key down? Is someone held the con shift key down and stuff like that? Okay. And at the moment we're just going to do get character because that's that that was our, our example. I still haven't quite answered your question. Um, let's type this in to a search engine, which is another way I would be answering this question if I was in your shoes. And so just type um, JavaFX, FX. Type that, right? And then, um, there it is. This is the one we really want. Notice how it says docs.oracle.com. This is the standard documentation website. And people have asked about what you can use uh, in the, what's, what's legal to use in your assignment and so forth. Docs.oracle.com is, is, is legal. Okay, so now you can see that um, the type is JarFX scene input key event. That's the name of the type. I think that was the question that you gave me, is what type is it? And you can see here, there's all the methods we get on it. All right, so um, there are all the methods and that's how you find it. Uh, let's just go back and I'll show you what I did again. I said JarFX set on key type, that was the method we used. And when I did that search, it came up with the key, key event, um, which is um, how, uh, which, which basically answers your question. Okay, oh, sorry, um, yeah, um, let's just go through. Set, set on key type, here it is. And it takes an event handler and you can see here, set on key type, that's the one we just did, and you can see that its argument is a key event, all right? It's a key event. So, um, and the particular one um, is uh, the, the, the arguments you saw in IntelliJ when I did press, just pressed the dot and got it to do the autocomplete, it gave me all the different options. Now, let's do something slightly more, hopefully there's, if you have any more questions, please fire away, but uh, assuming that there's no more questions on that one, let's move on and do something ever so slightly more interesting, just to finish this off. Let's say, um, if key event dot get character equals, um, dot equals, we're gonna do this dot equals thing in a minute, we're gonna talk about this in a moment, um, equals the letter Q, Q like that, Right, if it equals that, then do something else. Else, do, do what we just did. So what we're gonna do is we'll say, say, if the person presses the uppercase Q, then we'll exit. And the way you exit in JavaFX is also important. The way you do it is you call this platform dot exit. All right, platform dot exit. That's how you exit uh, JavaFX gracefully. The other way to do it is to kill the window or to, to press that little um, red X up there when it's running. But um, you can do it by saying a platform dot exit. So what this program should do is um, when we set our scene, we say that for this scene, what we want you to do is for the whole scene, if anyone um, types a key, then do the following. For that key event, check if the if the character in the event is equal to Q, that is you gave me an event, I'll look at the event, if there's a Q inside of it, I'll say okay, then I'm gonna do a platform exit, otherwise I'm gonna take that character and I'm gonna put it in this um, string here, you typed A and then that's the string, and I'm gonna change the high text here to be this string. Okay, so let's just run that. And it's a little slow. Okay, there it is, and same behavior as before, but as I mash the keyboard, it just, just tells me what I typed. But when I press the uppercase Q, which I'll do now, the window disappears. And it didn't do so very gracefully. Um, someone is trying to, okay. It didn't, it didn't detach as gracefully as it should have, but that's, uh, that's unpleasant. <laughs> that's a gyro FX issue, but that's actually the proper way you're supposed to exit. Okay, so let's just ignore that, that pile of rubbish at the bottom of the screen there. But you, we'll do that again. But that, that was caused by us exiting up here. And then we'll do um, exit. Okay, with that, let's um, exit fine that time. So I don't know what, what happened there. <laughs> Strange. All right, um, 
let's move on now. Um, unless there's any last questions on the um, on, on, on JavaFX. Let's move on to revision control. Now, as you all know, we, we use Git in this class, and I've tried to explain to you before why we're using Git. We're using Git because it's a very industrially important revision control system. There are many systems out there. It has become the dominant one, whether it whether it's because it's a good one or not is kind of beside the point. The fact is it's the dominant one. And um, it's a very powerful one and it's become the de facto industry standard. There are other very similar ones. In fact, in this class, we used to teach Mercurial, which is a very nice one, very similar to Git, but it's just uh, faded into second place. And um, I wanted you, and there's better tooling for Git and I'm trying to make things as easy as possible for you in terms of tooling. So we're using Git as of about five years ago or so, some number of years ago, we switched to using Git. Um, so that's what Git is. And there's a story which I do want to tell you sometime um, involving um, a guy I did my PhD with called Andrew Tridgell. Um, and it's, it's not a fully verified confirmed story um, because um, it's kind of interesting, but it's about what happened with, a, with a, the version control system for the Linux operating system, which is called BitKeeper. And when Andrew reverse engineered the protocol there, um, that ended up well, this is actually completely confirmed. You can read all this on, on, on a Wikipedia page. But what happened was um, uh, there was a proprietary thing like Git that was being used by the Linux kernel. Some people thought that wasn't so, so great to have a proprietary um, system for the Linux kernel. And Andrew reverse engineered it, uh, was very careful to follow all the rules and not, not violate any intellectual property agreements. He reverse engineered it and um, then uh, there was a kerfuffle and what ended up happening is Linus Torvalds, the guy who maintains Linux, ended up having to write or deciding to write his own version control system and that's Git. The, the little twist in the story, which is the slightly unconfirmed one, which you can read the rumors on, is why it's called Git and that goes back to, to Tridge. Anyway, that's, that's a story for another day. So concepts in um, Git, there's a, the concept of a commit as a noun um, as opposed to the verb, right? So that thing is a commit, and you can see a series of commits. And um, there's staging. Um, it allows you to um, to uh, get things ready to commit and then commit them. But the way IntelliJ works, you kind of ignore this. So we're, we're going to ignore it in this class here. But you can, if if you're interested, you can you can follow up on that. Then there's to actually do a commit, the verb, as opposed to the noun, and that will atomically commit the changes in your local repo. Okay, so you've made a bunch of changes, you do um, control K or whatever it is on your particular operating system and IntelliJ will um, commit those, or you use the drop down menu for commit. It will, it will say, hey, do you wanna commit all the changes you've made? And you can say yes, and you can type a commit message and it will atomically commit those changes. Now, the word atomic is really important. I raised this in our earlier, um, lecture on Git, atomic means they're all done at once or they're not done at all. This is a really important concept in computer science. We will come back to it many times and if you do a, a degree in computer science, you'll hear this concept repeatedly, this, this concept of atomicity. And um, the best analogy, one of the best analogies that, that most of you are aware of is the concept of atomicity around a transaction used say for a bank. Um, and um, when you go and buy something, you want uh, online or if you're trying to get cash out of a cash machine, um, what you want to have happen is when you tap your card, you want the money to come out of your account and go into the, the vendor's account at the same time, both happening together or not happening at all. What you do not want is the money to come out of your account but not go into the vendor's account and then, and then them to say, hey, you didn't pay me but you've lost the money, right? That would be really bad, right? And conversely, they don't want the opposite either. They don't want the money to, to, um, to go the other way. So, so it's very important they both happen or not at all, okay? So you, there's two parts to the transaction um, and, and you've got to have them both happen. So when I say the other way, so for example, if, um, if uh, uh, you're um, buying something online, you want to make sure that you get the thing and you pay for it and the vendor wants to make sure you pay for it as well as you getting it, right? So there's a reciproca reciprocation there. And an atomicity is about making sure that all that happens. So the point is with a commit in Git is all those changes you made all happen together or they didn't happen at all. It's not like some bits happen and some bits don't. That's a very useful property. A push is when the commits that you have on your local device are pushed to your remote repository. And this is a concept we've told you about many times and I think all of you are familiar with it now. And a pull is when you pull changes from the remote uh, repo and an update is when you update your, your working version. Merge is when you um, merge a branch, which we're gonna to come to, and reset and revert ways of going back, okay, to, to, a, to a particular state. 
these are all important concepts which we're, we're going to go through now. So a little bit more detail on git commits. It captures a set of changes, including modifications, additions, and deletions. So git can say, I deleted this file. It can say, I added this file. It can say, I changed this file. And it can have multiple files in the one repo. Every commit has a unique commit ID, which is a large number, which you see written out as a hex, hexadecimal number. And there's a parent-child relationship, depending on the state of the repository was in, the, the state that the repository was in when you did the commit. So if you were using the repository and the last commit was this, then you do another commit, there'll be a parent-child relationship between those. The, the latest commit will be a child of the, um, the other one, okay? That's the way the parent-child relationship works. Um, normally we have a single parent and a single child. And most of the time you will have seen that in, in most of the code you've written so far. Once you start working in groups, things get a lot more interesting because you could have uh, multiple people working on the same repo at the same time. And that little illustration on the side there um, is a snapshot from, um, from last semester. And you can see um, there's one of our tutors there, Ash, and you can see someone else, an anonymous person, I don't know who that is. And you can see um, uh, that two people are working on the same repo, okay? And you can see that um, in that particular example, you can see there that 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 that, that second uh, that this commit here by Ash, that actually the first commit because time's going this way, that commit there by Ash is this. It's got a little green box around it. That's this commit, and um, so she she did her commit based on this uh, this revision here. So she is looking at the code here. It is here, and she goes and makes a change. But meanwhile, this person here has made two more changes based on this one. So they both have this repo, Ash has gone and made a change to it, and this other person has made two changes to it, okay? Now we've got to reconcile them, okay? And so what Ash does is a merge and bring these two things together, okay? So going back to here, when you have a single parent and a single child, that's the simple case is what you see here. So this is the parent, this is the child, okay? When you have multiple children, which is what you have here. This one has two children, it has that as a child, and it has that as a child. Um, when you have multiple children, that's called a branch. So we call this thing, this thing, this green thing here, we call that a branch, okay? So we've got a branch here, and whoops, we did not mean to do that. Um, and then, then if you've got multiple parents, this commit here has multiple parents. See, this commit has that parent and that parent, okay? And that's what we call a merge. So if we have multiple children, it's a branch. If we have multiple parents, it's a merge, and merge is when you bring together two, two things that are divergent, and a branch is when you make things divergent, okay? And when you do a push, it sends them, and a pull will get the commits. And commits basically are never deleted, so there's this ever-growing record of what happened. There are actually ways to delete them, but essentially we never do that, and which is a bit like in a bank or whatever. Um, if the bank accidentally gave you a bunch of money, they don't magically undo the fact that they accidentally gave you a bunch of money. What they'll do is create a new transaction which reverses the old one. So you end up with two transactions, this one and then the reversing one, okay? So you don't delete things, you don't disappear things from history. The history remains there forever and ever. Um, and uh, what you can do though is have, have new commits which undo the effect of previous ones just by reversing the changes, okay? So we do that uh, as separate commits and we don't, somehow or other magic away the previous ones. An update, um, when you do an update, by default it will take you to the head, which is the most recently known commit. However, you can update to any revision, and um, you need to specify it. In IntelliJ, it's quite easy to do. You can just go and look at the history, and then you can go to a revision, and you can click on that revision and bring everything in your repo up to that point. You need to be a little bit careful, right? Because if, if you're this red person here, and you said, actually take me back to here, then you start doing work, so you were here, and then they, you went back to here, and then you started doing work and you did another commit. Now you would have created a new branch, so you'd have three branches here, right? Because th this one would now have two children, the original child and this new child you created, okay? So when you go back in time and start working based off of a place back in time, you're likely to be creating a new branch. If you do any commits, you're creating a new branch, okay? Which may be what you want to do, but maybe not. And in fact, I noticed someone on Piazza was asking about, hey, they've got some slightly crazy idea and they want to do it in a branch. That's exactly the right thing to do. I didn't respond to that because we're just about to teach you about branches um, and um, I didn't really want to encourage you to do things we haven't yet actually taught you to do. I mean, you're very welcome to do them, but, um, but I, I didn't want to weigh in on that yet. All right. Um, oh, hi, Steve. Yeah. Here's a question. Um, what happens if there's a merge conflict? Um, anyways. Right, merge conflicts. That's a great question. What happens if there's a merge conflict? Okay, there, there, there are merge conflicts that Git can straightforwardly resolve. 
so they're not actually conflicting. So a merge can happen when things don't conflict. So if we've got two files, um, a readme file and a hello world file, and um, we both and, and I make them and someone edits the hello world file. Meanwhile, I've added the readme file. Then um, those things are merged straightforwardly because they're not conflicting. There's no conflict at all. And in fact, this is even true. Git's intelligent enough that if, if you go and change some text at the top of the readme file, and I change some down at the bottom, it can just figure that out for itself. Okay, which is great. Um, however, if um, you actually actually edit the exact same stuff, things get complicated. It can't automatically resolve it. In which case, we need to resolve. We've got a conflict. We'll have a merge conflict. Okay. I'm not going to talk about it, except as you can see, it's actually mentioned on the slide here. Whoops, it's mentioned on the slide here. Um, but um, what you're going to do is you're going to work through a really thorough work example in your lab next week, okay? And as a group. So we're, what we're going to do in the, in the lab, just as a heads up, is we're going to get you to do things that are deliberately creating a mess and then show you how to unpick the mess, okay? So we're doing that on purpose so that when you do run into a mess, you will have already had some familiarity on how to unpick it, okay? So we're gonna have three of you in a group of three all doing things in a particular order which will create a mess and then you need to unpick that mess. And uh, um, one golden rule that uh, some people I notice on Piazza do get confused about, and that is they do a pull when they've got changes in their repo which they haven't committed. You need to either you need to get rid of uncommitted changes. You need to either throw them away, undo them, or you commit them, and then Git will merge in automatically. Okay. So um, one thing that won't work, it won't let you do the pull, is if you've got uncommitted changes. Uh, you can amend a commit commit message, so you can essentially redo a commit and you can even change what's in that previous commit before you've pushed, which is really handy, okay? So you can, if you've um, made a commit and you go, oh dang, I didn't do X or oh, dang, I want to change the change the um, the commit message, you can do that with amend, okay? So amend is, can be used to, to, to change the prior commit. But once you've pushed, you can't do that, okay? As soon as you've pushed, it's gone out into the wild as it were. But as long as it's local to your local repo, you can change a prior commit. You can, you can do more extreme things than that, but we're not gonna teach that here. But you can certainly quite easily change that, and IntelliJ lets you do that quite easily in its commit dialog. Um, you can reset your local state to a particular commit with reset, and you can um, also do that, um, as I said, with um, by using the, the, the dialog when you see the history in, um, in IntelliJ. And you can also revert any particular commit. Um, the way revert works is by creating a new commit which undoes the effect of the other one. So it doesn't magic away the other one, it simply does a new commit which has the opposite effect. Like if you accidentally withdrew $1,000, um, then you can do another transaction which puts back $1,000 and so the net effect is zero, but you actually on your record will say minus 1,000 and plus 1,000. It doesn't just disappear the minus 1,000, it keeps a record that says those two things happened. And uh, I just thought this uh, XKCD cartoon was um, relevant. Um, it <laughs> I've got very mixed feelings about Git. It's very powerful, but it's it's terrible. I think I think it's terribly designed. It's um it's it, there's a lot about it which I find rather unintuitive. It's one of these tools I use all the time, but but I find myself forever looking up how to do things on uh, Stack Overflow or whatever. Uh, the the basic stuff I could kind of do blindfolded. I think most of the time, but anything remotely different, it just I find it I do find it rather hard to work with. We teach it to you simply because it's what pretty much everyone uses. So it's an important tool to use, but um, I apologize, that's, that's the best our, our community can do. And um, yeah, anyway, that, that, that's, uh, that's Git for you. Um, mini quiz on Git. Where is it? Um, publish the poll. All right, um, they just published the, the poll there. Next one, uh, next, next question is also on software development. And we're now gonna look at Teams. Um, and the, um, this is really super important and the timing of this is very careful because you're just about to create, uh, find your team. Remember folks, this week you'll find your team. The teams are random, okay? This is on purpose. We literally use a random selection to create your teams. So uh, you won't know who's in your team. You just won't know who's gonna be in there, okay? So it's a random selection to, to create your team. Um, this might seem cruel and, and unpleasant, but in fact, it's, um, it's, it's how the real world works sometimes in that you'll find yourself working with people who you didn't expect. It could be a client or a customer that you didn't know you were gonna to have to work with and so forth. Working with people who you don't know or um, um, is actually a, a really common thing that you have to do in the real world. So here I'm gonna step through some things about working in teams. 
I love this quote, um, and I think that um, that often in computer science this gets lost. So I really want to emphasize this for all of you. Tom DeMarco is a great software engineering uh, star of uh, the, the, the computer science community. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people don't realize that computer science in any creative discipline is deeply social, particularly computer science, because a large part of what we do is build things that people interact with. Okay, so you build an app for a phone, you build um, software that people use on the desktop, or you build an app that controls a machine that humans use. Okay, any of these things are deeply, deeply social things. And for those who, who, who have this, this, this idea that computer science is a retreat into technology, no, it's not. It's, it's deeply, deeply sociological. And whenever I've looked at deep problems with large software projects, it's almost always something that boils down to the sociological dimension of the work that's going on. Why, um, why, for example, abstraction got broken uh, in some very large piece of software like I found when we were working on the V8 um, uh, JavaScript engine. Why? Well, it's because of social pressures. It's not really uh, so much a technical thing, but a social one. So please take this to heart and understand that working, and working with other people and understanding how other people work is actually at the heart of computer science. And I'm hoping that over the years our curriculum will increasingly include more um, about this. So why do software projects fail? That's the question. The answer is people. <laughs> simple. That's a, that's a simple one. If you go and read read this uh, read this book, so why do software projects fail? And and many of you will have heard about spectacular failures of software. There there there's forever lots and lots and lots of uh, examples of spectacular fa failures. Sometimes they're dramatic ones, like uh, missiles blowing up or spaceships getting lost and stuff like this, which cost a huge amount of money or people's lives. Other times they're just um, they're just expensive ones, like you know the, ta the tax department in, in, um, introducing some new thing and spending crazy amounts of money and getting nothing at the end because the whole software system failed. There's, you can do a web search and find tons of examples about t software failure. Okay, so this, I, th I thought this was really quite, quite interesting, which is why I've included in the lecture here. Understanding team effectiveness. There's a major study by Google, and I've got the link down there, um, which you can look at. Um, and I think I put it on the website, um, on the S3 um, lecture part on the website. Major study of 180 teams worldwide. So they did a big study. They gathered a whole lot of data on the different team members. You know, things like, you know, is this person an old grumpy guy? Is it a nice, cheerful young person? Um, is this person um, an introvert? Is, are they an extrovert? Um, have they coded for 20 years? Have they never coded before in their life? All this sort of stuff. They find all these things out. And then they try to look at how all these different, these different things affect the efficacy of the team. And they did a whole lot of, Google loves crunching numbers. I, you know, I've worked with Google, I did a sabbatical there. Um, they're very data driven. So they love doing these big studies and trying to work out what makes the software development effective. And by the way, the, the people I work with at Google were exceptional um, software engineers. It was actually a really, really good and interesting experience. But this is typical here. They've done this huge study, 180 teams, that's a lot of people. Um, and they've done it all around the world. And they've tried to find the main factors that are correlated with performance, that is the performance of the team, right? So, were the teammates co-located? Now, this is pre-COVID. The study was on pre-COVID. So, um, so most, most people were co-located, right? Because they'll be in the same office. Um, um, Consensus-driven decision-making. How did the, the teams make decisions? Did they um, do it through consensus? Or did they, um, uh, did, was there an autocrat who says, this is what we're doing? Um, extroversion of team members. Were people like friendly and outgoing? Or they, not friendly, got nothing to do with the extroversion, by the way. Um, were they outgoing and kind of loud? Or were they um, preferring to be nice and quiet? quiet? Um, uh, were, um, were individual performance uh, team members like superstars? Like this person, they, they love this term in the tech industry, a rock star, which is such a such a stupid buzzword. But anyway, they, did this team have rock stars on it? Um, how big was the workload? Was was there, was this a giant project or a small project? And uh, how senior were the people? Were they were they really experienced senior people? Uh, was it a huge team, a small team? Uh, tenure means like how long were they in this role or in this job uh, at this company? Right, they might have had lots of jobs in different places. So tenure is like how long they've been around. Um, so they used all these factors. So the question for you, and maybe you can put this on the chat: What do you think were the most important factors here? What do you think were the key factors um, that affected the that, that affected the um, performance? Maybe Leo can uh, tell me what what's being typed out here. So, what were the key among these that drove um, the effectiveness of software teams? That's what we're asking about. 
Can anyone think what the, what the dominant factors were? There's a whole bunch there. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear if there's anything there, Leah. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, spoiler alert, none of them uh, did. We got one. Oh, you got one. <laughs> I'll go back. What, what was it? This is driven decision making. It's from Harrison. Yep. That's a great suggestion. That's a, I mean, you know, um, uh, because, because I, I was teasing you all because I knew the answer, of course, but a lot of these are really plausible answers. And I think consensus driven decision making is one of the ones I would rate as one of the ones I think would be most likely. Certainly the opposite. That is an autocratic thing. Um, so Friendship, yeah, people, or people, they get on with each other well. Yeah, these are great suggestions, folks. So I'm not trying to trap you or trick you, but the answer is this. It's surprising. I think a lot of people would find this surprising, that those factors did not significantly impact, okay? So they measured all those things, and they looked, and they said that um, these did not significantly impact. This does not mean that they're not important in other settings, or there's, there's not other reasons why these are important things. And I think the consensus-driven decision-making is a great example of something that is actually important in many places. But what they found was, whether or not it's important in other settings, it did not, have, it did not uh, have a statistically significant effect on the performance of software teams, which is kind of weird, right? What did they find? The number one thing that they found is psychological safety. So it meant that team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. This is incredib incredibly important. This is a little bit like what I've tried to tell you in lectures before. I want you all to be brave, okay? I don't want you to be frightened of the computer, but you also shouldn't be frightened of your teammates, okay? I've told you lots of times, don't be frightened of the software. Just be brave, have confidence that what you're gonna do is okay. You can reverse out of it. I forget, forgot when I went through all that Git stuff. The main thing about Git that I want to remind you of is it's a mechanism by which you can go back to where you were before when everything worked, which should give you psychological safety, right? Because it makes you feel like, okay, everything's okay. We, everything was working yesterday. If everything goes badly today, we can always wind back to how it was yesterday, okay? And that's, all, that's about psychological safety. But this is also about whether or not I can make mistakes in front of my teammates. If you can't make mistakes, you're in big trouble. As you, any of you who've been watching the lectures know, I make mistakes all the time. And if I felt like I couldn't make mistakes, I'd be in big trouble, okay? And so psychological safety, they found, was number one. That is, the people felt like they could be vulnerable in front of each other. So then the, que the obvious question is, how do you, um, how do you think, uh, how do you create an environment where that exists? And that, uh, that comes down to trust, okay? And trust and knowing each other, okay? And someone talked about friendship. I, I don't think friendship itself is important. You could have someone there who you're not actually particularly good friends with, but you could trust them. Okay, you might have very different interests and so forth and so on. That could be a very different age. It's not really the sort of person you, you want, want to um, do social things with, but you could still trust them a lot, okay, and feel safe in front of them. That is, you oh, felt. Hey, yeah, another question from Leo. I think we have a different opinion from Liam. Um, he said that uh, I refuse to believe that workload size has no effect. Uh, at like a thousand hours of work on two people in a short time, that's not an effective team, even uh, if only because they can do a small percentage. Does, doesn't that matter? Yeah, um, okay, so, so this, this uh, that's a good question. So I don't know if you all can hear Leo's, what Leo's saying. So someone was saying on the chat that they, that they find it hard to believe this. Well, it's, this is a matter of fact. I mean, you can go and read the study. I've got the link there. You can go and read it. So this is not um, conjecture. This is not someone guessing. They actually went and measured this, right? So this is actually true. Um, so the question is, why is it true or how could this be true? Because I, I, I get what Liam's saying. It sounds implausible, right? How could that even be, be, be that workload size doesn't matter? Um, well, it's a matter of how we characterize it, of course, and they've probably characterized it fairly care, carefully. I think probably what they're talking about, uh, Liam, I don't know. You have to go back and look. I, I did read this, but I haven't got it in my head right now. They're probably talking there about the workload, meaning that it's a very big, complicated workload or a small one, but they might scale the team appropriately for the workload. So they're not talking about the ratio of team to size of the problem, but the size of the problem, okay? So this is just about the size of the problem, not about the relationship between the team size and the size of the problem, okay? So um, certainly if you said to a team of three, go and build a Linux kernel, that um, probably won't work, right? 
Um, but, but if you said uh, to a, a team of a thousand, go build a kernel, maybe that would work, okay? So you definitely need to do, you definitely need to size the workload and the team together correctly, but what this is saying is on its own, workload per se is not a, a, a statistically significant. Likewise, team on its own is not statistically significant. So if you've got a very big problem, you might have a very big team. What they're saying is the team size per se doesn't influence this and nor does the workload per se. Hope that makes sense. But you can go read it. You can go read this. This is this is a good report written by um, um, uh, a good report written by very sensible people. So go take a um, go take a read. Um, then, um, uh, sorry, I got distracted. I got a phone call there from my my old PhD supervisor, which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> So my phone just went off. All right, so let me just get back on, get my focus back here. Dependability. Um, the next th next point in the list was that you need to feel like you can depend on people, which is which also goes back to trust, right? Um, so they need people um, to be able to depend on their teammates, right? A structure and clarity is the um, is is the structure of the team clear, and do they have clear roles? Okay, meaning. Meaning I find really important. I'm surprised it's not high in the list, but this is just the outcome of this study, right? So the meaning says that people find that this particular work is actually meaning, meaningful to them. I do work that, because I really enjoy it sort of thing. If, if I don't find meaning in the work I'm doing, I find it very hard to do it, okay? So I'm very driven to do work that I find meaning in. That, that's what that's about. Impact, which is connected with meaning, is that they feel like um, their work matters and creates change. Um, so you're doing something that's going to impact lots of other people, which is really cool, okay? So now, um, one of the important things you're going to need to deal with is um, conflict resolution because conflict is actually part of nearly any work environment. And um, whenever you're working under stress, you will find there is conflict, okay? So the question is, how do you deal with conflict? Um, because you're almost certainly going to find it in your team because you will be working under stress. All of you will find stress around deadlines. Everyone finds stress around deadlines. And when you're working on a hard problem, there'll be stress. So the question is, how do you deal with it? Oh, I just want to take a moment to digress on one other point. Every year when I go to class this size, there'll always be one or two students say, hey, you know what? I don't really want to work in a team. Can I just do this on my own? And my answer is, Absolutely not. And why not? Because working as a team is actually one of the key learning outcomes for this, this thing. And if you're the sort of person who can only work on your own and can't work with other people, then you should not be passing this course, okay? That sounds really harsh of me, but that's actually why it's a learning outcome because software is almost never built by solitary individuals. It's almost always built in a, in a, in a broader context. And certainly in almost any job that you folks will be getting, you'll be working with other people. So it's actually a learning outcome from the course that you work in a team. And so no, you can't say, hey, you know, I want to opt out of all this team stuff. I don't really like working with other people. Unfortunately, in this class, you're going to have to uh, figure out how to do that. And one of the things that's going to be necessary is working out how to deal with conflict resolution. And then here's a list which I think is really useful. Number one, define acceptable behavior. So we need to know what we think is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Okay, that needs to be clear so people don't do unacceptable things without realizing that they've actually broken some, rule, some implicit rule. Better to have the rules explicit. Don't avoid conflict. That might seem strange. Don't avoid conflict. What this means is don't step around the conflict. Take it on meet it head on and address it directly, okay? That doesn't mean escalate it. No, 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 that's not what it says. It says but don't avoid it, don't step around it, okay? But, but um, you don't want to escalate it. So what that means is if you see a problem, talk it through. Don't just pretend it's not there. Choose a neutral location. If there is conflict, choose someone neutral, okay? Now, what that means in a virtual setting is interesting, but in a physical setting, that may mean don't go to that person's office or that person's cubicle to discuss it. Go to the cafe or something like that, somewhere that's that's removed from both of you. Okay, um, otherwise you've got you're going to have a prejudice uh, pre a prejudice situation. Okay, so you need a neutral location. It's good to start with a compliment, like "Hey, I really like the way you built ABC." Okay, good to start that way. Okay, I'm, if you can't find something nice to say to someone, then you need to think very carefully. Okay, you should be able to find something positive you can say. I really like your sweater. <laughs> or something. You should be able to find something nice to say to someone. Um, don't jump to conclusions, okay? So the classic one here is don't assume their intentions, okay? So they deleted this file. Was it because they hate your work and they're trying to subvert the whole project and undermine everything? 
or was it because they made a mistake? Let's not jump to conclusions, okay? The answer most often, as many of you know, when you're not feeling hot under the collar and when you're, when you're calm and sane, is that most often when this happens, it's done by accident, okay? People most often are not wicked and evil, okay? So don't jump to conclusions. It's easy to jump to conclusions when you're feeling frustrated. Don't do that. Think opportunistically, not punitively. It's like, hey, you think this and I think that. Maybe we can do something new with this rather than, hey, you think this, that's not gonna happen. I'm gonna do it this way, right? You need to try and think opportunistically. What can we make of this, this difference of opinion? And often in my, my experience in research in particular, differences of opinion can often generate completely new, really excellent ideas. Offer guidance, not solution. What that means is um, you don't go and say, hey, what you need to do is X, Y, and Z, right? That is not the way to solve the problem. Instead, what you need to do is say, um, might I suggest that you consider A or maybe you can, you can consider B as a pathway, right? Rather than tell them precisely what to do. Constructive criticism, the best thing you can do is to say, hey, um, something, try and say something constructive. Rather than point out that something's broken, say, hey, maybe we can fix it by doing this. Far better to say, hey, maybe we can fix it than just to say, hey, that thing there is broken. And uh, don't intimidate. So don't be overbearing and in someone's face, okay? Try to do things if you possibly can in a way that doesn't intimidate your colleagues. And act decisively. This jumps to, that's like number two, do things do things clearly with decision, okay? Don't do things ambiguously and murky-like, right? That, is, that tends to make um, conflict worse, is when things are murky and unclear. So try to act decisively. Um, those of you who have paid attention to the course webpage will know that um, on the side there, there's a thing called the Code of Conduct. Please take a read of that. This is really important. I, and this is relevant to the whole class. Um, even when you're online, it's really relevant, but it's particularly relevant when you're doing group work, okay? So please take a moment to read that um, code of conduct. And um, there's no mini quiz for that. And with that, we move on to the next thing. Um, I'm assuming you all can just um, put, press the, your, um, j just stand up and go and get a coffee or get a cup of tea or whenever you, whenever you want. So. Um, in the interest of your time, I'm just going to keep plowing through rather than taking a break because I'm assuming you're all taking breaks just when you need to. So um, for that reason, I'm not going to take a break today um, because I really think that it'd be good to get this stuff behind us. So now we're going to talk about number and auto boxing. This stuff's interesting, I think. Um, it's uh, the next module in, in our Java story. So um, here's, a, here's a story. Uh, you all know what a box is, right? You all, know, you all know, know what a box is. Particularly these days, you tend to buy a lot of stuff online. We all tend to buy a lot of stuff online. And when it arrives, it's almost always in a box. Okay, I want you to think about what, why we have boxes. Okay, what's the good of a box? Okay, think about, I don't know, I'm just looking around my room here. Um, think about maybe a vase or something like that. Why would we have a box? Okay, why would we have a box? So there's a few, there's a number of reasons. One is the box can protect it. Okay, another is that we can pack things together more neatly when they're boxed. Okay, if there's just a big pile of vases, it, we, it's harder to pack them and then we put them on pallets and ship them and so forth and so on. Boxes are quite useful because they've become in standard sizes. That's another reason for it. Okay, so a box is a container that, that we, we wrap things up in, it protects them and it, it makes things more uniform. Right, hopefully, this is intuitively obvious to you. So, a box is always good. Maybe not. Why not? It's because there's actually a cost associated with a box. So do we put everything in a box? Yeah, so when I buy, I don't know, like uh, this mouse, this mouse came in a box, this keyboard came in a separate box, I ordered them at the same time, they come in a box. Even this pencil over here, which I, which I got um, for my iPad, that came in a its own little box, okay? So people do tend to put a lot of things in boxes these days, but we don't put everything in a box. Why not? Because there's a cost associated with a box in, in the real world. Okay, I'm drawing an analogy here with something we do in computer science, but it's actually not a bad analogy. And in fact, we actually, in computer science, use the word box to represent the concept I'm just getting to. So think about if you go to the hardware store and buy nails, do you find every nail in a box? No, you don't. Why not? Because the overhead of putting every single nail in a box would be ridiculous, right? You buy 100 or 1,000 nails, you don't want all 1,000 of them being in a box. 
what's the overhead there? Well, there's the paper or whatever it is that's making the box. And then there's the effort of unwrapping every single, every single one of them. Besides, what's the, the, the benefit is minimal when you've, um, the nail is pretty robust anyway. The vase, yeah, you know, you can see why you want to put a vase in a box, but a nail, okay. So this analogy actually works relatively well for the concept I'm getting to right now. And that is in Java, we have these primitive types, which we've emphasized a lot at the start of the course, including int, short, and float. But we can also have boxed analogs to each of these, such as int, short, and float. Notice that, the in, sorry, integer, short, and float. Notice the difference between those words. Integer is spelled out in full, it has a capital I at the front. Short is the same spelling, but it's got a capital S. And float is um, with a capital F. These are all classes. They all inherit from JavaLang object. And they have rich properties, okay? But integer has exactly the same insides as an int. Short has the same insides as a, as a, as a short, and float has the same insides as a float, and so forth. So what we're doing is we're wrapping these in a box. Sometimes that's a good idea. This is a bit like wrapping your nail up in a box. It's rarely a good idea, but sometimes it is. Okay, and one of the reasons why it's a good idea is because we can had, have methods on these types, which we can't have methods on the primitive types. That's one of the things about primitive types. They can't have methods associated with them. So we can have something like toString, which will take an integer and give you a string that represents that integer. ParseInt, which will take a string and turn it into an, an integer, and so forth. Not only that, but we can have other things like uh, the minimum value for integers, the minimum value for, or the maximum value for shorts, and so forth and so on. So we can have properties associated with these types, okay, which we can't do with the primitive types. There is a space overhead, which hopefully you're totally on top of now because of my silly analogy with the nails in boxes. There is a space overhead, which is why we don't always do it. And um, because you actually create an object in the heap, you actually use the keyword new, N-E-W, new, and then you say integer with a capital I. And that actually creates an object in the heap. And if you use this with the um, Java Visualizer, you'll see the difference, okay? So we don't do it if we don't need to. Now, um, it turns out that our Java runtimes are smart enough that they can see what you're trying to do with it and, and they can work out ways to remove the boxes when they're not really needed so they can reduce this overhead. But um, by and large, in fact, what happens is you do get that overhead, which is why we don't always use them when by default. We, and more importantly, that's why it, Java, I said this right at the start of the, this course, I explained that we have primitive types in Java and the reason for it is because the alternative to having primitive types would be you have everything in a box and if everything was in a box, then there would be an overhead which is hard to completely remove and this is the overhead of wrapping every nail in a box. What is autoboxing? Um, so I just explained to you that integer and character are box versions of the primitive types int and char and um, same for Boolean and so forth. There, there, are, there are a whole family of them. Um, and they're, so they're object versions of the primitives. The word we use in Java, but also in other programming languages is this notion of box. They literally use the word box, which is the analogy I was giving you, but we actually use the word box. So we talk about boxing something and unboxing something, okay? So um, now you can see the examples there. We've, we also have, Java has this, this nice thing that converts automatically. And that's called auto boxing, which is the title of this slide. And you can see in that example there, the first one is integer i equals five. And so the thing on the right there, that numeral five, that's an int, that's a, that's a, that's a basic type. And the thing on the left there, that, that i there is of type integer. So what's gonna happen is Java says, oh, let me take that five, put it in a box and make i uh, equal to, i is gonna be a reference to that box, okay? So now i is a box with five inside of it. On the other hand, Unboxing, auto-unboxing also happens in Java. So if you, we declare a primitive type, J, which can't be a box, it's a primitive type, and we assign it the value of I, which is actually a box, Java says, oh, I know what you're trying to do here. I'm gonna pull the primitive out of that box and give it to you. So it goes to I, which is a boxed integer, pulls out the value, which in this case would be five, and gives it to J. So J is an int with the value of five in that case. So that's auto-boxing. I think this is the, the last, yep, this is the last slide on this section here. Now I'm going to talk about another class which has some similarity to the, to the things I've just talked about, but it's a little different. It's the math class. Um, math is a special class which has a, some methods and constants that are useful for basic math. So you've got constants such as pi and e, which are you know, math constants. And you've also got trigonometry um, op operations like sine and cos and so forth. You've also got rounding ones. You've already seen me, I think, use max. Uh, 
which takes the maximum value. I used that, I think, when I did the redeem function in the, um, in the Comp 1110 student. I think that's what I, when I used it. You've also got rounding ones to take the absolute value, the ceiling and the floor and so forth. And you've got exponentials and logs. So you can take the exponent, you can take the logarithm, the power, you can take the raise it into a particular power. We've also got random number generation in math, but we also, I've already introduced you to random dot, um, the, the random class, which is another way to do it. We usually use the random class, but you can also do it through the math class. Now with that, we're ready for the next mini quiz. We're cracking along here. Um, and there it is. And time to start writing some code where we'll flesh these ideas out. Oops, didn't mean to do that. So now we're going to create a new package. New Java package. Uh, lectures J, uh, what is it, J10. And then in here, we're going to create a type called, uh, what is it? Let me have a look at my notes here. Yeah, we're going to type a, create a, uh, a class here called boxing. New Java class, boxing. Okay, and we'll add it to git and we'll write ourselves a main method. Okay, here's the main method. Now, we're going to start off by, um, first of all, doing this integer, um, just move my notes a bit closer so I can see what I'm what planning to do here. Yep, integer a, this is straight off the lecture slide basically, because new, I'm going to create a new box here, integer, and then put something inside of it, call it seven, okay? So now, um, it's interesting, IntelliJ is smart enough to say, hey, you don't really need to do that. Um, for reasons that will become clear to you in a moment. But what I'm doing here, what I've written is perfectly legal, okay? It's just saying you don't need to do it this way. So what I've done is I've said, let's create ourselves an integer, A, and it's gonna to refer to a new object of type integer whose value is seven, okay? Now, um, let's create another one, integer B equals um, six, say, and What's happening here is exactly like in the lecture slide, uh, Java is saying, hey, here's a value, it's an int. I'm gonna automatically create a box, put six inside of it and give B that box, okay? So this is auto boxing. Okay, and the thing above is explicit boxing. Okay, we're explicitly creating box integer, if I can just spell. Um, um, but in, um, IntelliJ is saying, hey, you don't really need to do that. You can just do it this way. That's what, that's, that's what the line through it saying is. You don't need to do it like that. You can just do this. But I'm showing it to you anyway so you can see the concept rather than what, what, what Java is doing is brushing stuff under the rug, which is kind of nice but it also disguises what's really going on, okay? So these two lines are basically equivalent. It would be exactly equivalent if I changed that, that to a seven. Now let's do something else. Uh, let's do the following. Let's C equals um, B. What's going on there? C is an int. It's being assigned B, but B is an integer, not an int. So that's an int, that's an integer. So we're, we're doing that. So what's going on here? Well, this is auto unboxing. So what Java will do is take the contents of B, say, okay, there's a box there, let's take the int out of that and give it to C. So C will now be equal to six um, because it will do auto unboxing. So this is auto unboxing. Okay, then um, what we can do here is you can say, if A equals, now I'm gonna write some stuff here, I'm gonna get you to tell Leo in the chat what you think is gonna happen and I've, I've distracted myself and written something silly. There we go. If A equals B, what's going to happen, folks? I'm going to write some, some pretty stuff here to... Uh... Uh, in fact, there's a question in the chat. Is there any difference between auto and explicit boxing? If not, why is explicit boxing a thing? The, uh, the question, the, in case you didn't hear what Leo said, there was a question in the chat saying, what's the difference between auto boxing and explicit boxing? And if there's no difference, then why do we even do explicit boxing? And the answer is, there is no difference except extra text, and we don't do explicit boxing. I'll put, make that very clear, deprecated. Deprecated. 
right? If I could, I, st I still haven't spelled that right. But anyway, deprecated, okay? So it's deprecated. We don't do it this way. I've just done it that way to make you make it clear to you what's really happening. And look, when I hover over it, you can see the error, the message that IntelliJ is telling me. It's unnecessary. Don't do it, okay? Deprecated like, with an E. Okay, deprecated with an E. Um, um, so you don't do it this way. That's the answer to the question. You don't do it this way. You just do it this way. But I've shown you so you can understand explicitly what's going on. Okay, now, to, there's, uh, so let's just write these two options here. So I want you to think about uh, what, the, what this if statement is going to resolve to. Is A equal to B is the first thing. I want you to, to write that in. So write in the chat if you think A equals B with a double equal sign there. Okay, write in the chat if you think A equals B with a double equal sign. And I'm going to write some stuff here while um, you think about it. Wait to make this pretty. suggest a equals to b will be evaluated to be to be false and right. he suggests you to use dot equals method all right let's just see if other people have ideas um so ideally i'd get a vote on this so so do, do people have other ideas to michael if you do please put them in the chat all right so there's the two possibilities so uh, if they're equal we'll print this out and if they're not equal we'll print this out and we'll see what their values are okay so any other idea? Did you get? Did anyone have another idea on this? Um, I think most people just um, say the same thing. All right. Yeah. It's too bad we're not in the lecture theater. I, I like to. I like to see people put their hands up and commit. Oh, what was that, Leah? Um, I mean, most people just. I think everyone just say you stop equals. Yeah. All right. A, a bit of group think here. Let's run. Let's run. Let's run the code and see what happens. Yeah, and, and, and Michael is right, okay? So A is not equal to B, and it, so it printed out this line here because they're not equal. Why are they not equal, okay? This is actually subtle. For those of you who said, yeah, they're definitely not equal, the question is why? Um, actually, wait, 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 wait. Um, no, 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 hang on. I meant to do this, I'm sorry. Now are they equal? Okay, folks, just, just let me do that. that. Sorry, I meant to do this. Of course they weren't equal. They're obviously not equal because um, they were different values. But, but now I've made them the same value, right? So what's going to happen now, folks? So that one's 6 and that one's 6. Are they equal or they're not equal? Is A equal to B? Any opinions on this? Is A equal to B? This is really important to think this through. It's not obvious. There's something really strange going on here, folks. Leo, did you get any suggestions there on whether A equals B if they both got the value of 6? Uh, Ethan says steer force, and Danny says no, and um, Ethan actually explained why. Okay, I'll, I'll try and explain it now then, all right? So let's just run this. Let's just go through this. I slightly goofed up my example there. I wanted to have them both equal to 6 at the start. I didn't realize I had still had one equal to 7. But if you run this now, what you see is a slightly surprising result. A is 6, which is not equal to B, which is 6. How can they not be equal? They're both six. Okay, and the answer is that this double equal is saying is, is this is an object, an integer object with capital I. That's an object. And B is an integer object, capital I. They are not the same object. The value they have inside of them happens to be the same. They both have the number six inside of them, but they're separate objects. They're different boxes. There's a box here and a box here. Box A has six in it. Box B has six in it. This question is asking us, is the box A equal to the box B? And the answer is no, they're different boxes, okay? And um, what we're gonna do now, following the cue from the, um, the class, we're gonna try this all over again, but we're gonna do it using the equals method, just like someone suggested online. A dot equals B, there it is. So if A equals B, then we change this to equals, so people now, what do you think is going to happen? I think some of your colleagues have already given it away. I think uh, I'll just run this anyway because I think we, we've already heard the answer online. If we run this now, what's going to happen is we get a different answer. 
okay? And so here it says not equals, so this evaluates the not equals because this is checking whether that box is the same box as that box in the different boxes. Whereas in this case, we're using the dot equals method and it will choose, use the equals method for integers. And the equals method for integers will actually check if the two values are the same. So it will look inside the box A and say, what's inside here? Oh, it's six. It'll look inside B and say, what's inside here? Oh, it's six. And it'll say six equals six. They're equal. Okay, so the equal method returns true, but the double equal sign returns false because this is comparing the references, and these are references to different boxes, whereas this is actually checking for a quality between what these two um, things hold. Okay, very important and very subtle. And so, uh, so if you didn't follow that, don't feel bad about it. You'll need to, one thing you may want to do is look at this in the Waterloo Visualizer. I, I think I've got an example in the Waterloo Visualizer. Look at it there. I'm going to do one more thing. Uh, let's just cut and paste to make this faster. Uh, what do I want to do? Yeah, A equals C. Change this. So what's the answer here going to be, folks? I'll make the screen slightly bigger so you can see what's above. Okay. What's going, to, what's going to happen here? Can anyone see what's going to happen here? This is not easy to figure out. Any, any, anything from the, um, the chat there, Leo? For a... Uh, not yet. I guess there's slight delay. Okay, sure. Yeah, I know there's a delay, folks. So um, um, I'm not meaning to sound impatient. Okay, this is subtle. Okay. Michael, yep. Mm -hmm. Minka, actually. Minka, um, yep. One of them will be boxed it and unboxed it. Probably the right one. What, so what was the answer? What, what, what do they think is going to happen? Which one? The first is uh, going to be double equal or not equal? Uh, Liam suggests not equal. Okay. All right. So it sounds like everyone's suitably confused. And I expect you to be confused. This is subtle, folks. So don't worry if you're confused by this. Let's just run it. And we'll, we'll talk it through in a moment. So I'm, I've hit the, no, I haven't. Now I've hit the run button. Watch what happens. Now they are equal. Okay, let's think about why. What's going on here is we've got A here. What is it? That's an integer. We've got C here, which is an int. Okay. And so what's actually happening in Java says, if I need to compare an int with an integer, I'm going to have to unbox the integer and then do an int comparison. It, in theory, you could think it might do it the other way around. That is, it could box the int and do an integer comparison, but it doesn't. It unboxes the integer, which is A. It unboxes that, so it takes it out of its box and compares it with C, which is an int, which happens to have the value six. We can see that there. So what it does is it compares those two things and says, those two things, we're gonna treat them as ints, and yep, they're equal to each other. All right, so this is subtle, okay? And the reason for this is because we've got auto unboxing. Right, so now we've got int of value six is, being repla is replacing A, and then we've got an int of value six here, and of course they're equal. All right, so that's quite subtle and it's quite interesting and uh, quite important. And with that, we've finished that unit. So let's move on to the next one. We've got something very similar here. And um, here we're going to look at um, characters and strings, quite similar to what we just did with, um, with, with the, the boxing. So we've got a character class, which just by analogy, boxes the char class. So you looked at char earlier, we used char in assignment one. So a character, character class is a box version of that, okay? And we have methods and constants useful for manipulating characters. We can ask for a character, is it a letter? Is it a digit? And things like that. You can't do that for char because char doesn't have any methods on it. It's a primitive type. The character has methods on it. So you can convert something to a character and then ask these questions. Is it a letter? Is it a digit? And so forth. You can convert a char into a string. Okay? So it'll be a string of, one, of length one, right? It'll just be one character. Um, you can use escape sequences to represent characters that have special meaning in Java. So you can, if you want to represent a backtick, then you use backslash backtick. If you want to use a quote, you use a, um, a backslash quote and so forth. And if you want to use a backslash, you do double backslash and so on. There's a whole list of these things. 
The string class is a very special class that's provided by Java. It's not like a normal class, it's mysterious um, because it's provided deep inside the innards of Java. Um, and you can create a string object from a literal. So there you say, here's a string X, it's gonna create an object with the, with the letters foo in it, with a string foo in it. You can do concatenation as you've seen me do time and time again in the first three weeks of this class with a plus sign. So uh, if we say X and we do a plus, it actually concatenates, it's not a plus, it's a concatenation. And there is also a string builder class which allows you to construct strings. You can get the length of a string. So you can say um, x dot length is greater than three, do the following, and you've seen that already. You can get the character with char out, you can get a substring with substrings, you can split strings, trim, trim strings, you can take, turn them into lowercase, you can turn them into uppercase. You can find the index of a particular thing within the string, and you can find out if a string contains something. You can replace characters in a string. So there's a whole lot of operations you can do on strings. Now let's run the mini quiz for that one. And move on and write some code. And here we're gonna do something fun. Well, the beginnings of something fun anyway. Um, in our next, or well, soon we'll do something more fun with what we, oops, hang on. Um, let me just check what I want to do here. Yeah. We're gonna do something with the game Boggle. This is the first installment of our work with Boggle. J11.boggle. There it is. I'll add it to. Now, what's Boggle, you might well ask? Well, let me have a look here. Here, it's a fun game, and we're gonna do we're gonna use this game uh, in the class. Um, so that's the Wikipedia page. You can go search it yourself, but you end up with this, this contraption over here. And what you see there in that, in that picture is um, you see a special thing here which has 16 um, dice in it. See the 16 dice there? Each dice, of course, has, uh, each die, of course, has six sides to it. And then it's got a special plastic lid and you shake it all up and then they land like this. So two things are going on here. One is that the, the dice are going into random places in that little 4x4 grid. That's one thing that's going on. And the other thing that's going on is that they're landing up, they're, they're, they're being jumbled around. So each, each particular die will land on one of the six sides. Okay, so you've got a lot of, lot of random stuff going on. And then what you need to do to play the game, which we're not doing in today's lecture, but we're gonna do soon, we're gonna do a solver for this, which will be fun, um, is you're gonna try and find words that are made by adjacent letters here, or diagonally adjacent as well, I think, in, 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 yeah, diagonally and directly adjacent. So you can find, see, see here you've got the word net. Right, and you can also do cent, S-E-N-T, cent. And uh, you can also do gent, G-E-N-T, gent. Um, you can do no, but in fact, um, in this game, you've got to have, um, you've got to have the, the words have to, I think, be uh, at least three characters long, and so forth. Anyway, so the, the game, it's a game people play. You do this and you've got a, a certain amount of time, which is done with the egg timer there and you've got to try and find as many words as you can using these very simple rules. We're gonna do that later, but what we're gonna do in today's um, little exercise is we're going to um, <clears throat> write a little thing that emulates this randomized set of letters. So we've got 16 dice, each with six sides, and we're going to randomly assign those six dice to the 16, sorry, 16 dice to the 16 positions, so that's gonna be one level of randomness, which dice goes where, that's one level of randomness. And then for each dice, for each die, we're gonna choose which face is up, okay? Now, I've done a little bit of homework for us and I've got the um, strange uh, encoding of Boggle Dice here, because I actually have special dice and I've, to make the thing more realistic, because we're actually gonna later on play it. That there is, I've just cut and paste in the actual um, letter organizations. You see, they're, they're all slightly different. And um, perhaps not surprisingly, they're not completely random. So there are more vowels in here and less Zs and Xs and things like that. All right, so that's our dice. Now what I want us to do, and this is gonna be an exercise in, in messing with characters and strings, is we're going to write a very small little program here. Um, we're gonna write a very small program here. And what this program is gonna do is print out um, random, a random organization of those um, dice. So first of all, they're gonna be randomized in terms of their order. And second of all, we're gonna put each one in a different, uh, different face up for each one. So 
The approach I'm gonna take, so there's lots of ways you could do this, but what I'm gonna do here is I want you to think of a bag of dice, okay? So the bag of dice, and then we're gonna take one out at a time. So first of all, we'll put our hand in, pull one out, and then we'll place it. Then we'll, then we'll take another one out and place it. And the one we get each time will be random, will be one of, one of the 16. But of course, every time we do that, there'll be less in the bag, so we have to skip over the ones we've already taken out. All right, so let's write this. It sucks that we're not in a lecture theater because I'd really like to do this a bit more dynamically, but um, I, will, um, I will step us through it. Now, please, if you have any questions or suggestions, I encourage you to type them in and, and I'll get Leo to interrupt me. Otherwise, I'm just gonna blast ahead with a bit of code here and talk to you through it as we go. The first thing we're gonna do, so please uh, tell Leo if you've got ideas for how, how you'd like us to do this. Normally, I do this with everyone suggesting it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a variable called rand, which is of type random, which allows us to generate random things because we need two levels of randomness here, right? One is choosing which die to pick out of the 16 dice, and the other one is which face up. So we need to both of those. And then the other thing we should do is just take the row length. How do we know the length of the row? Well, the 16 here, so we can we know in our heads that's four, but imagine someone changed it to a different number. We'll just be slightly smart here and say uh, row length, length equals dice.length um, and we can use the math function to take the square root math dot square root of the number of dice so that should take the square root of 16 which should give us four now what's happened here it's given us a complaint and it says that we needed an int but it gave us a double because this is an int and the answer to this is a double so what we do is we cast and we say force that that double into an int it turns out we know the answer is going to be a whole number anyway because we know that actually that's always going to be a square number up there. So that's all good. Okay, so now we've got a thing which tells us how many in a row, that, which would just be useful later on, but it also it provides me a way of showing you something with a math, math library. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically write a for loop which has 16 in there, which will do 16, 16 um, instances of pulling one out of the bag, the, the bag, the virtual bag, and putting it into place. Okay, and the way we'll know that we've pulled it out is we'll make a null, we'll use that array there, the array of dice, and we'll set the string, so there's a string, it's an array of string, right? So as we pluck one out, we'll set its string to null, that way it will know it's gone, right? So we'll say for um, int i equals zero, i is less than um, dice.length, i plus plus. So that's gonna go around 16 times, right? And now what we want to do is choose, each time we go around, choose one of these at random, okay? So we'll say um, die int uh, die equals, um, um, how do we do that? We say rand, which is our random number generator. We'll say next int, and how many are there? Well, the 16 positions in the array, some of them could have been taken, but still the 16 possibilities. So we'd say 16 here, and what that will do is choose a number between zero and 15 and give us, and so the, the, the value die will be a value between zero and 15. Now, bear in mind that at the beginning, it'll give us a die, a die for sure, but it could give us um, an empty one later on once we start using the die up, because the whole point of this is we're pulling them out of the bag, so we could end up with, with nothing, in which case we'll have to go, we have to go through this array until we find one. Okay, so we can do this, we can say while, while um, dice, dot die um, is not equal to null, or is equal to null, like if we, if we land on one that's empty, then just go to the next one, right? So we'll say um, die plus plus, right? By the way, folks, if you see me do anything that doesn't look right, please write it in the chat and I'll get Leo to interrupt me, okay? So we're gonna go through this thing and find a die that is non-null. And eventually, this'll they'll all be null except the last one. We'll get that last one because we'll skip over the ones that are null. That's the idea here, all right? So now we've found one. So we've found a die, which, which is the integer die, which will be number between zero and 15. And what we're gonna do is roll that die, okay? So we've, we're gonna say, um, we've gotta say which face we want, right? So there's six faces on each one of these die. So we say int face, equals, and then we're gonna choose another random number, next int, but this time it'll be a number between zero and five, right? We want it with six options for faces. So this is six faces. And then up here, we're gonna say uh, 16 dice. Well, actually the better way to do it is this. We could just say um, dice.length. That would be cleaner code in here instead of 16, right? 
Um, okay, so we're going to choose a number between 0 and 15 up there and, and between 0 and 5 down here. All right, so now we've chosen the face. Now we need to get the um, string for the die that we've chosen, right? And um, we'll say char. That's going to be, we're going to get a, a character out of that string. It's char value equals, how do we pull that value out of the string that we want? Well, first of all, we get the string that we need, which is going to be dice, bracket die. So that's going to be the particular string that will give us a string. And then from that one, we're going to say char at, and we'll take the face, right? So it will take the nth one. So if the, if it's, if the, this face is zero, it'll take this character. If the value is five, it'll take that character. Okay. So it'll, it'll take that value. Now that we've got the value, um, we can, um, or we've got to remember now that we've dragged this, this one out and we've used the value, we can, we can null this one out because we've said, okay, we've taken that one. So we can say dice, bracket die equals null. All right, so we've used it up. Um, so that so it'll be marked as null. Don't forget, folks, if you see anything wrong in what I've written, you need to write in the chat and tell, uh, tell uh, Leo, the spoiler alert, there's already one significant mistake here. I'm just waiting for someone to notice. <laughs> All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna print that out. We'll say uh, S out. And we won't do a print line, we'll just do a print, so it'll just print them out without any breaks, and we'll print out the value, All right? And then if we want to be really nice, what we can do is we can put out a new line after every row. So we can say, if um, I um, integer remainder row length equals um, row length minus one, that means we're at the end of the row, then S out print line. So we'll print a new line. Okay, now let's run this and it all should work, right? No one's, no one's found any errors. Let's see what happens. Let's just run this one. And let's have a look here. And it did work. What the heck? That should not have worked. Yeah, okay. We got very, very lucky that first time. <laughs> All right, so this is what I was expecting to happen before. Um, and what's happened here is we've got an array out of bounds exception because we've got an index 16 for something that's of length 16, which is what we see here. So we're indexing into this array of dice with a value that's bigger. So the problem is we keep incrementing dice. So if we land on this one and then just keep marching that way, we'll eventually um, go off the end and then we'll have to wrap around. So um, uh, what we need to do in fact is make the um, die be equal to um, die plus one and then take the integer remainder with um, dice.length. So that if it comes out to be 16, we want to go back to the start. Okay, so we want to wrap around, right? Hopefully this is making sense to you. Hopefully you can see why that, that error was there. And once we've done that, we should have a working boggle. Let's run it. There we go, it worked. Run it again, and it's still working. We're getting different things here. Now, if I wanted to always produce the same one because I was doing debugging, can anyone remember how I do that? I could use a random seed. So that's that's one way we can do that is I think we do it here like that, type some number in there like that. And now when we run it, it will give us a random selection, but it will give us the same random thing every time we run it. So run it again, it should come up exactly the same. Waiting, oh, I need to run it again, the same thing. Okay, that's because I put the seed in here. So it still generates a random selection, but it's the same random selection every time. Okay, we'll get rid of that because we actually want it to be different every time because it's more fun. The game would be boring if we always had the same, same uh, thing. So now you can all go and play Boggle with uh, the lecture code. Very good. Um, and hopefully you all understand that error I made. Finally, we're gonna do generics. Okay, so this is the last thing for uh, today is generics. And this is, I think generics are fun um, and interesting and they're certainly useful. So. Um, sometimes it's useful to parameterize a class with a type. This sounds really strange. So we're going to write a class, but the class will, will have a type associated with it and we can change that type. So instead of making a container for integers, 
This is particularly useful when we have containers, which we're going to do a lot of later in, in the semester as we go on, and starting right about now, we're going to have these things called containers. We have different kinds of containers, things like sets, maps, lists. And instead of having a special set for integers and a special set for strings and a special set for longs, we can create a container like a set with a parameter t and then create instances where that t is a specific type like integer, character, long, string, comp1110 student, whatever it might be. Okay, so we can also create methods that take arguments that are type parameters. So we can say accept some value and the value is a value of type t. We haven't defined t except when we create that class. So we can say value might end up being a comp1110 student or value might be a string. Okay, before we did this, the only way we could do this, do this kind of a thing before, before Java had this, the, the uh, generics, is we used object because object is the parent of all types. So if you said this, uh, this um, was a set of objects, then, um, then of course it could take any type. But the problem with that, of course, is it could be all different kinds of objects. It could be uh, animals and aeroplanes all mixed up as one. But you might want to say, no, no, this is a container just for dogs, or this is a container just for animals, or this is a container just for aeroplanes. And it would allow you to do that, right? And it would make you an instance of the container which only allowed aeroplanes or only allowed dogs or only allowed cats. Whereas if you made it a container of objects, then you could be mayhem because anything could be in there and you wouldn't know what type it was because anything or all objects uh, inherit from Java Lang object. So that's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, so, so I put this here because I think it's fun. Um, some of you, probably most of you have no idea what this is. Uh, uh, this is actually from a children's book, a very, very old children's book. It was around when I was a kid. Um, Richard Scarry, um, and he used these um, strange uh, creatures to illustrate a whole lot of things in the real world. But one of the funny things he did, which, which, which is kind of cute, is that all these creatures had specialized vehicles and stuff, like you see the worm there has got an apple car and the, the pig there has got a gherkin truck and so on, or pickle truck, right? Why did I put this here? Well, because in the real world, this concept of generics actually applies in the real world. We do not move pickles in pickle trucks. We do not deliver apples in apple cars. We do not have specialized containers for every special thing. In fact, one of the things that came out of World War II and Australia was actually involved in this was the idea of pallets, palletization and, uh, and so forth, which allowed shipping to be a lot more efficient because things became uniform and they used boxes and pallets and stuff and containers weren't limited to a particular type. In fact, you, know, you now know we have shipping containers, steel containers with a, with a very uniform size, and you can put whatever type of thing you want in there, okay? So we don't have pickle trucks or apple cars. You don't make specially handcrafted things for every type. That's incredibly inefficient. Instead, we make generic things, generic trucks for carrying liquid. It could carry milk, it could carry wine, it could carry vinegar, it could carry any food stuff, right? That's a, a, a liquid carrying truck. You could have a generic truck for carrying packages and it could carry all kinds of packages in it, all right? So we try to make things general if we can and then you can say this particular consignment is all milk. So uh, it's, a, it's a milk truck but uh, the actual design of the truck and everything is general and it could be used for any uh, food stuffs, liquid food stuffs. All right, hopefully you get that concept with my silly little picture here. Hopefully it'll help you remember the concept. Let's get on with the uh, next poll. Where are we? Lost it. I have lost the poll. Where did it go? My goodness. Oh, here it is. Okay, so hopefully you can see that now, and let's go and write some code that illustrates the idea of generics, and then we're um, at the end of our coding for the day. So uh, this is unit J12, and we're going to write something called an integer linked list, an int linked list. So we'll write a linked list of integers. This is a new idea for you. Um, J12 uh, dot int linked list. We're going to call it int linked list. Okay, there you go. That's our, our class. Right, so what we're going to do is we're making ourselves the pickle truck, as it were. We're going to make a, a data structure called a linked list, and it's going to be just for integers, right? But this is not generics. We're going to, we're going to go on and make generics in a minute. Leo, your question. Oh, yeah. Um, I got a question from Claire. Um, uh, Claire asked, um, 
that's actually a question for I, I think for your previous demonstration. Instead of using a random dice generator each time to order the um, sixteen dices, um, can't we just randomly choose from the permutation set of the dice, or would that be a bit slower? Um. Good question. I, I don't completely understand, but the question is how we choose this this outer this outer one. I guess it's this one here. This line of code here is the question. Um, the first answer to my question is this is not about speed, so we're not particularly concerned with speed in this particular example. Um, but the second answer is that um, what you could do is shuffle that array. We'd have to write ourselves some special code for shuffling. If we had a shuffle method, then we could shuffle the array and then just take the just walk through the rating the first, second, third, and so forth. That would work perfectly. So if we had a uh, an array shuffle method, which we can do, then we could shuffle it and just take the consecutive elements if it was a random shuffle. So that's another perfectly good way to do it. But I did it here because this is a bit more explicit. But yeah, shuffling, I think that that's essentially the question is, couldn't we have just shuffled? And uh, that we could do that. Um, so shuffling is a permutation. And if you had a, a random permutation, then all you need to do is take the consecutive elements out of the array. That's a good idea. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to create ourselves an, a linked list of ints. Okay, so first of all, um, what is a linked list? A linked list is a structure which is a list as the name implies, and they're linked together. So what it consists of is a bunch of nodes where each node has two elements to it. It has a value, which in this case is an int, and has a reference to the next node in the list or null if it's the last one. Okay, so it's got a, a reference to it, the next, and it's got an, a value which is of type int in this case. So int value is one field, and um, and what's the type of the next thing? Can anyone guess what the next thing in a linked list is? This is interesting. This is what we call a recursive data type because the next thing, this thing called next, is going to be of type int linked list. So the type refers to itself. Okay, that's called a recursive data type, right? I'll just write that down here. We, we discussed recursive data types more later in, in the semester. But so it's a recursive data type. All right, so what we've got is just these two things. The value, which is going to be like 5 or 7 or whatever, and then a reference to the next thing in the list. So it's going to be a list of all these different integers. All right, so the first thing we need to do is create a constructor. And so the constructor is put this thing in the list. So put 7 in the list, put 13 in the list, put 12 in the list. And the way we're going to do that is this int link list write a constructor, it's going to take a value, and then we just say um, this dot value equals value. Like that, all right? Now what we want to be able to do is so that, that creates an empty linked list. The other thing we want to be able to do is add a value to an existing list, okay? So we can, we can have an add method that says add this to the existing list. So, and that, that'll be a void method, and we'll say add, and we'll have a value here, int value, and then we'll say, um, we'll just say uh, that, well, actually, so the, we've got to consider two cases. If the next thing in our list is nothing, then we can just create a new one and put it right next to us. So let's just deal with that one first. If next is nothing, null, so that means we're at the end of the list, then we just say next is this new thing, we'll just create a new object here, um, int linked list, we've got to say new, by the way, we've got to say new int linked list, new int linked list, uh, with that value, whatever that value was. Okay, so if, if we're at the end of the list, there's nothing next to us, then we say, okay, create a new node, put it over there, put this value in it. And of course, it's next, the next to here is null. We don't need to write that because, I'm just going to comment that out. All right, so we don't need to explicitly, some of you might be wondering, why don't we set next? Well, it's because next is automatically set to null by Java, um, unless you get, give it some other value. So we don't actually have to put that line in there. That'd be redundant if we put that in there. All right, so we're going to add something to this linked list. And if this linked list has nothing next to it, then we just simply create a new one, a new uh, node next to it, and have that value inside it. Otherwise, 
what we can do is we can recursively add. We say, hey, add it to the one next to me. There's a linked list next to me. Let's add it to that one. The node next to me is a linked list and let's add it to that. We'll just say um, next dot add a value, right? So that'll recursively go and add it to the one next to us. Now, what we want to do is, of course, have a two string method. We like two string methods because two string methods allow us to illustrate what's in this list. So we can say this public string to string. And um, like this. And then um, what we can do here is we can write this recursively as well. Um, so if we're the last element on the list, we can just print our current value. Say so that if next equals null, we're the last one. Then we just say um, not print return return value. Now you can't literally return that because the value is an int. So we want to uh, make to string return int. No, we don't want to do that. Or you can use string of value of that. The other thing we can do is a little tiny hack here. So we can just do that. We can say the string concatenation concatenate with an empty string. It forces that little int in to turn itself into a string. So it's a little kind of secret there. So otherwise, um, we'll, re we'll return what we will return. We'll return our value plus the value of everything next to us. So we'll say value plus, and then we'll put a comma and then next. And if we just say next, next will have its two string method called, which will then recurs and, and do this. All right, so what do I need to do now? I think we're, we're pretty much done. We've pretty much made our, our linked list. And by the way, we're just about at the hour. If you need to leave, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, you can just watch the recording. Incidentally, we're nearly finished here. I won't be very many more minutes, so feel free to stay if you've got a few more minutes. But if you need to leave, no worries. <clears throat> PSVM, oops, no. There it is, there's our main method. So what we're gonna do is create ourselves a new linked list, int linked list, list equals new int linked list. Um, five so we've created a linked list which has one node in it which is five all right and then we say list dot add and then we'll add some stuff so uh, in my example I'll just add a bunch of integers like this uh, list dot add um, like that it doesn't really matter what, what's in there and then we'll finally say um, s out print this thing out we'll say um, here it is and then we'll print out our list. Remember, we've already written a, a two string method, so we'll get the string for our list. Let's run this now and see what happens. And then we're gonna make a generic version of this, which will only take us a few moments. And that's like the, the crunch part of the class, the interesting part of the class is when we make this generic. Okay, so we've made ourselves a linked list. It's a list and we've printed the list out. We've added those things to the list. We've printed them out and it says there's five in there, there's a three in there, there's a four in there, and there's a 13 in there, which is exactly what we expect, five, a three, a four, and a 13. What we're gonna do now is so that's like your Gherkin truck. We've just made this, this data structure called a linked list that's only working for integers. What we wanna do is make it generic. So that this is, this is what we're gonna illustrate now and it will only take us a few minutes, which is really nice. So we'll copy this and we'll paste it. And now we'll make a new thing called generic linked list. Generic linked list. Okay, and then all we're gonna do here so we've changed its name to generic linked list. We do one bit of magic here, which we'll explain in the slides, and I'll, uh, you'll see here, is we've parameterized the type with a variable called t, which um, is a type parameter, okay? We don't need to use t, we can use z, x, y, and z, but there's a convention that says we use t for type parameters, it's just a convention, okay? And then what we can do, instead of making an int value, we make it a t value. So this could be a string, it could be a comp 11, 10 student, it could be anything. We need to make this a t value, and this a t value. Where else have we got ints in here? And that's it. All right. Now the int linked list should still work for integers, right? Sorry, the generic linked list should still work for integers. So this code should just work as it is. We should get exactly the same result. So let's just run this generic linked list. And all I did was change a bunch of stuff with, um, let's just run it, here it goes. Ta-da, it worked, okay? So I've just changed everything with apparently no effect. But what I've actually done is I've created a, 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 an int linked list which is just like the other one, but it's now generic. So I can reuse all that code for different types now. So let's just change this a name to i for integer, okay? And we'll do this whole thing over again for different kinds. And just this will only take a second. 
I'll just do it for doubles and I'll do it for strings just to, to emphasize the idea. So we'll do it for doubles now. We'll make a D, doubles, um, and we'll make all these Ds for double, D for double, D for double. So we've got a new variable called D for double. And, um, and then what we're gonna do here is put doubles in here. And we can make these different values just so you believe me that we've really done something different here. Um, okay, now let's run it. And we should get two different lists. We're using the same code, but we've got different types. We've got integers on the top, doubles afterwards. Let's have a look here. Fantastic. So we've got one linked list implementation. It can take multiple types. We'll just do this one more time over with strings and then we'll move on to our last part of the lecture, which is the bio, which will only take me a moment, but it's one of my favorite people. So let me get to that in a moment. This guy is really one of my favorites. All right. There it is. And we make these string strings. We can make a string that looks like that if you want. We can make a bunch of these things strings if you want like this and um, make this um, anything you want. Okay, and then so each one of those is a string rather than an integer or a double and we print them out. There we go, and it's printed out each of those strings. Those ones look the same because they're strings which have the same uh, value as um, as uh, the others. I changed that just to, just to make the point really clear, and we're done. So we've created a data structure called linked list. We've then turned it from being a special purpose linked list into a generic linked list, which can be used for lots of different types. And I've demonstrated it with integers, doubles, and strings. It could take any object, including Comp 1110 students or anything you want. All right, um, with that, we get to go on to our um, bio and we finish the lecture. So the bio today is Bob Floyd, an amazing person. Really sadly, he died um, relatively young from a, from a neurodegenerative disease. Um, he was a Turing Award winner way back in 1978 as a really young guy. Um, he had a huge influence on a bunch of things, um, including, uh, and perhaps very importantly, program correctness. Now, if you come to my office in the uh, building, you'll see, actually see right near my office, there's a room there called the Robin Milner Room. And um, right next to that is an enormous portrait of Bob Floyd, which I got. Um, it's a, I won't tell this story about how I got it, but it's a really cool story. I'll tell you someday if you really want to know. But I got this portrait of Bob Floyd. It's the exact same photo as this, but it's huge. And if you look, you'll see it's made up of tiny little dots. Those dots are organized in a special way. Each dot is black. Okay, but and, and then the, the, the different shades of gray are actually just spaces between the black dots. That's called dithering. The algorithm for dithering that you can see here is actually done using a, what's called Floyd, Floyd Steinberg dithering, which is an algorithm that Bob Floyd developed. That's not exactly his greatest achievement, although it is pretty cool. Um, he's most famous for program correctness and to integrating formal methods for program correctness with software engineering. So how we can make software better by applying formal methods. And ANU is a world leader in this field, that is using formal methods for understanding how to make software engineering correct. And in fact, the guy in the office right next to me, who's like three meters away from that, paint, that portrait, uh, is Michael Norrish. Michael Norrish is an amazing um, researcher at ANU. He's actually at Data61, or was at Data61, um, and is an associate at ANU. He was one of the key people who worked on the very famous piece of work which formally verified, did the first formal verification of an operating systems kernel. That's the SEL4 kernel. And Michael was responsible for understanding the formal semantics of the C programming language, which uh, which is, um, well, for modeling the C programming language. The problem with C is it doesn't actually have a formal semantics. And Michael was responsible for modeling that behavior so that when they had the operating system kernel written in C, they could write formal proofs about the correctness of that code. Really, really interesting work. Bob Floyd is the founder of it. He won the Turing Award in 1978. With that, I'll finish up. Have a great week. I know it's been a really hard weekend for, for people, particularly in Canberra. Um, and um, I wish the best with the, with the lab test and the